Where does your scepticism come from? I used to be a very devout Christian when I was younger, but didn't have a Christian family and didn't have uh, Christian friends. But I had one good Christian friend, but it came from a Bible reading class when I was young. It was a sort of unpleasant childhood indoctrination. But because I grew up without a Christian peer group, uh, when I got to university, it was relatively easy for me to kind of sort of think my way out of it in a way, to sort of start to challenge it and not feel too much guilt. I mean, and, and I, I started to learn hypnosis at the time. That was the sort of the first stepping stone to what I'm doing now. And I had all these Christians terribly upset and offended that I was doing it because it sort of ushered in demons as far as they, which to me I kind of thought, well, if, if you believe that God created us, surely the mind is the pinnacle of that creation. So why looking at the mind in any way would be seen as demonic and a bad thing? I didn't really understand, let alone... If you don't understand hypnosis, how can you say it ushers in demons? And I know I understand it better than, than they did. So that was a strange kind of, I realized there was just this fear issue with anything that was, was misunderstood. And the new age industry at that time was really blossoming and it was a, a real bit noir to the fairly rabid pastors that I, that I had uh, and saw at churches. But because at the same time I was getting into magic and through magic realizing how things like tarot cards and psychics really work, and that there's nothing mystical about it that could therefore be seen as dangerous, but it's just simply just sort of rubbish and charlatanism and, and, and psychology at work. I'd talk to psychics and I'd listen to their sort of circular belief and I'd think, well, I'm just doing, I am just doing exactly the same thing as a Christian. The only difference is it's easier to sort of laugh at them because it's a fringe belief, whereas my belief is so much more mm -hmm. endorsed institutionally that it's, it's, it's more respectable. But I thought, well, I, I, I'm just being a hypocrite, so I started to read and theology texts and, and books about sort of how the Bible really kind of came together and a kind of a mixture of books that I hope would at least challenge my easy pat answers that I had as a, as a young Christian. And I, I felt that if I could undo all the easy answers, if I just had a bunch of questions, that I might actually be able to build a much stronger, more defensible faith from it. And then that just sort of didn't happen. It just all seemed silly and I realized there was, there was no going back. And once you accept that the Bible isn't, isn't a historical account of things that have happened, then you're sort of left with no, no basis for it at all. From that then, I wanted to defend my non-belief as strongly as I felt that I should have been able to defend it as a believer. On the back of that and off the back of the magic, a, a sort of an understanding how these supposedly paranormal industries work. So we have information on things like placebo effect and information like cold reading and these things exist and false memories and anecdotal and all, all those things that are important. And taking that on board is just about being able to make better decisions. That's about being truly open-minded, ignoring them and putting them to one side in this sort of pursuit of, of um, easy answers and, and um, intuition as the be-all and end-all of, of truth. That's not being open-minded at all. I think that's very narrow-minded. And certainly to laugh at people that say that evidence is important, I think that's, that's you know, it's, um, hypocrisy of the worst kind to, uh, to call them narrow-minded. Darren, could you begin by telling me what cold reading is and how it's used? From psychics to spiritualists to palm readers to graphologists to uh, astrologists, the expert in question is either just simply deluded and naive or they're using a skill called cold reading, which is a way of communicating information to somebody where it sounds like they know everything about you and they can reveal facts seemingly about your life and describe your character in a, in a way that you'd be amazed by. Because in fact it's, it's a linguistic trick or a set of linguistic tricks where they're saying words and you're constantly supplying the meaning yourself but it can be very convincing. And those tricks can give the impression that the person knows everything about your character or might refer to facts and things from your life or from your past that they seemingly couldn't know. The first psychic, a so-called psychic, uh, a trickster, was trying to pretend to guess I don't know, the name of the sitter's grandfather or something like that. What, what would be the kind of thing they might do? Even guessing the name of a grandfather, if you back up, what tends to happen is that the psychic will, if it's with a group of people, throw, it, throw out a name and say, I'm getting the name uh, John or Albert or some name that's sort of suitable for the age group they're working with. Now, that name could refer to a person in the audience who's living or it could refer to someone that's died or it could be a friend of the person. You know, it really could be anything. So it's up to somebody to pick up on it and turn it into what they want it to be. And, of course, if they say, yes, that was my husband, then the reader can go, yes, that's right, he's here, he's saying, he's saying, he still loves you. Uh, Barnum statements uh, are part of the, the toolkit of the cold reading psychic, named after the showman P.T. Barnum, who famously said that he had something for everyone, and they are statements which apply to everyone, although they'll always sound very specific to the individual. You know, pretty much everybody's had some creative pursuit at some point that they've left behind them, uh, and if I point that out to you, you know, it might sound very insightful, but really it could just apply to anybody. There's a 
terrific experiment that was done on this with um, students. I've, I've filmed this myself. We did it with three different groups of people across the world, where you have everybody in the group is given a, um, a reading, a personality reading, and uh, normally beforehand there's some nonsense about asking for their birth date or getting some <laughs> objects off them. That, you know, so there's some sort of process apparently involved, and they're given a reading. And it's a long reading. It's a very detailed personality reading, and they all get one individual. They're all asked to read it. And invariably, they will all say afterwards that it's very, very accurate, that it was not at all vague or ambiguous of what people might expect. And they'll give it 85, 90, 95% accuracy. And I can, I've seen this happen and people are amazed by it. And then you get them to swap with each other. And so maybe perhaps you can identify someone else by their reading, and then they realise they've all been given exactly yeah. the same thing, which was written months ago before, before I even met them. You know, These are statements along the lines of, you're somebody who... You tend to keep people a little bit at bay, but when... Well, when you're a caring person. You, yeah, you're a caring person. Yeah, you you yeah. keep people a little bit, little bit at bay there. You tend to keep people at arm's length. But when, they, when you allow people into that inner sanctum of, you know, when they become your close friends, mm. if they betray you, then that, you know, that, that, that really hurts. You know? And you're not saying anything other than you're closer to people that you're close to. Then mm. It means nothing, yeah. absolutely nothing. Yes. Yeah. And horoscopes are the same. I mean, that, that, they use yeah. the same principle. Be because those things have to apply to anybody, because there's no interaction going on. You know, a horoscope or, um, or something given, you know, when everyone's getting the same thing. There's no feedback, so you're simply relying on things that apply to anybody. What you can do when you're interacting with somebody is you can fork off from one way or another. I think I'll say that. You know, you can you can uh, you can go one way or the other depending on the response you get. So if I said to you, the spirits are telling me you've got quite a temper, uh, you could say you could answer yes or no to that. You might agree or disagree. Now, if you agree with it, it feels like a hit, and I can say yes, that's right. I can sense that you've got a real temper. Dot dot dot. If you say no, I can say. Um, but what's great about you is that you've learnt to uh, control it on the outside. It still feels like a hit. Uh, linguistically, what they tend to do is they say. Um, they put the word not in into the question, so they'll say things like, oh, one recent reading I was listening to was, she said, y y now you haven't, you haven't been drinking a lot of water recently, have you? And by, putting, by phrasing it in the negative, it allows a yes or no to be a hit. And the answer was, uh, was no, and she said, well, you should do it. The spirit's telling me you need to be drinking more than you are. You haven't been drinking much. And it sounded like a, a hit. Mm -hmm. Equally, if the person said yes, it would have seemed like, yes, they're telling me, you, you know, either way. A common ruse also is to make statements that allow you to have both sides of the coin in one go. So, for example, if I said to you, you've got an extrovert side and an introvert side, that's not remotely convincing at all. That that's, seems to be a given. But if you say to somebody, uh, when you're at a party, you're very good, you're, you're very good at being able to um, hold court, you know, you can, you can entertain people, you're very good at being uh, really uh, the life and soul of the party. But what's interesting about you is that when you walk away from that, you'll often find yourself at home running back through conversations in your head and uh, wondering, oh, what did that person mean? Why did I say that? That was stupid. And when you're even at those parties, even though you like to think that you're somebody who who can be, you know, in, in charge and very charismatic, you'll often find yourself just stood there thinking, God, why am I here? It's like everyone is a million miles away, and you're aware that that is a facade that you, that you put on. Now, whether or not that applies to you, the fact is all I'm doing is saying that you've got an introvert and an extrovert side, which cancels itself out. It means nothing. And yet most people will, will find a way of sort of making that easily fit themselves. Now, when you analyse these things like the Barnum effect and cold reading, uh, you're doing it in a sort of rational way. Mm. I take it that the psychics and palm readers and astrologers and people who do it know perfectly well what they're doing, and therefore they are fakes. Um, but are all of them fakes, or are, do some of them somehow manage to fool themselves as well? The difference is you can yeah. see when cold readings at work, when you know the tricks, when you know the same old things coming out about You've got an old box of photographs at home with the tricks that they come out with and the, the pushing for statements making somebody make a statement hit, and if they don't, moving on to the next person. One I was listening to recently, you've, you've been doing a lot of spirit telling me you've been doing a lot of sewing. And that woman was like, no. So, well, is it somebody in the spirit plane has been doing a lot of sewing? No, she couldn't make a hit. And it was, so went to the next person, is, is it for you? You've been doing a lot of sewing. And the woman was, no. She said, well, there's a, a coat, you've got a coat at home with, uh, there's a button that's loose or a, or a hem that's loose. No, I mean, it wasn't <laughs> working. And in the end, she said, well, have a look for that, my dear. Have, they're telling me there's a, there's a, you know. And it went from... Yeah. Somebody, you know, to, to nothing. So in, when you see that, you, well, that, that's clearly that person is, they know exactly yeah. what they're doing. They're desperately trying to get a hit. You know, I've been to psychic training colleges and seen people that are very sincerely trying to learn. You know, they've been told they believe that they're a bit psychic because, you know, we all 
have a certain amount of intuition and we all, you know, if we misunderstand things like kind of coincidence and a phone ringing because we've been, we've been thinking of somebody earlier on that day and the phone rings and it's them, we might mistake that for being psychic if we don't really understand how those things can easily happen quite a lot of the time. So I think there are plenty of people who learn it genuinely and really think that, you know, whether it's palm reading or tarot cards or whatever, that there really is a system. But and they just think there's a... The instructors on the training course are teaching cold reading while dressing it up as though it was yeah. genuine. So they really are charlatans then? I think so. I yeah. think so. It's, it's difficult because cold reading is something that you can be taught to do without it seeming like tricks. Oh, you know, okay. I've, I mean, I've been in a situation where trainee psychics are sat around saying things to each other like, I'm sensing you're on a bus and the bus is going the wrong way, but it might not be a bus, it might be a relationship. <laughs> and, and when you're hearing things like that, you think, well, okay, this isn't cold reading, this is just people sort of apotheosizing intuition and just learning to just, well, I'll just speak openly and I know this other person's going to make it fit because we're all partisan and we're all learning together. When but, they're learning it all together, they're mm. still dressing it up in their own minds as the spirit world talking yes, to them rather absolutely. than... absolutely. But all it being, is, it's just, yes. it's just being intuitive and being open and being, well, just say what you feel, that's all it is. It's this whole thing of intuiting your way to yeah. enlightenment and knowledge that the teachers who are maybe more media savvy, more sort of career psychics and mediums are very aware of, are very aware of what's going on and very aware of what the tricks are, but it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to tell. But. I've heard it suggested that sometimes these um, rather lucrative acts that people put on of psychic um, mm. divination and things often start out as a kind of folie à deux, that, that, that somebody and his partner or his father or something um, kind of manage to convince each other that, that they can do something that they can't, and they sort of rev each other up, but still kind of half believe in that they, they really are psychic, because mm. once they had a really good success, which was a genuine accident or something, and so they're, and, and they're encouraged by this folie à deux um, partnership, mm. uh, and maybe, maybe the partner um, rigs it so that even the performer thinks he's getting hits, which, he, which he's really not, that kind of thing. I think there, there are two common routes. One is the magician getting into the area that I'm into, which is sort of the sort of psychological mentalism, it's called, but then realising that you can step over the line and pretend to be doing it for real, and there's a lot more money in that. So, yeah. So there is more money are... if you pretend to be something that you're not. There's, yeah, there's... The moment you're saying it's real, the moment you say it's real, you're tapping into something enormous in people. Yes. Yeah. The, the other route, the, 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 you know, the stage medium, going back to sort of, you know, Doris Stokes very famously, sort of normally from showbiz stock, um, have normally been taught the skills by people from that world that, you know, just see it as part of performance, as part of, show, uh, part of showbiz. Um, and, again, I think those are skills that are then turned rather ugly, but that, you know, that, that's a very common route as well. I think the... Uh, very rarely, I think, is there any real belief in it, other than the fact that if you are spending your life lying to people, how do you deal with that other than rationalise it in your own head after a while and decide, well, I do kind of believe in it, and I do believe the intuition. It may not be psychic, but I do believe that I'm intuitive, and that maybe that does give me an insight, and it comforts people. And you start to rationalise it and maybe create a sort of a loose belief around it that follows after the fact. But I, I think very few people get into it at that level from any kind of sincere yeah. beginnings. I, I know the teacher of one of the uh, very famous modern psychics who's absolutely taught them as fraudulent techniques and is upset with him for passing them off as real. I won't say who it is. They do make a lot more money by pretending to be psychic than they do by uh, frankly admitting that they are conjurers. Yes, it's a, it's a huge racket. There's a very fine line to be tread. I mean, in, in, in my world, I'm sort of, on the one hand, trying to create a, a magic illusion. On the other hand, wanting to be honest about it as well. And the justification that psychics give is that it, well, it comforts people. My feeling on that is, if they're lies, who are you to decide that your lies are what people need to hear to comfort them? And I think it's a, it's a yeah. twisted, it's a twisted yeah. logic. If, you know, if you've lost somebody dear to you, and, and I'm trampling all over those those memories by telling you that they're here now saying this and that. I mean, that's none of it's none of my business. And if I'm just doing it because I can earn some money out of it. And, and when you watch these people at work, so much of it is, is ego. I mean, some of the the mediums at these spiritualist shows, especially the, the ones that aren't so good, they just look like second-rate stage hypnotists that you might see in a, in a pub or, you know, in Corfu or something. It's horrendous. And it's, it's that I find really quite ugly. 
Do you think that people are ever actually positively damaged psychologically by attending seances with mediums? I think there are certainly rare cases, uh, of, maybe not that rare, of people who get quite addicted to it. You know, if you've lost someone that's very dear to you, it's, um, it's an ugly situation where some, you know, if you get addicted to a charlatan or a number of charlatans on stage, if you go to every medium show you can because you want to reconnect with someone you've lost. I think that's, I think that's damaging. A friend of a woman who'd been to a, uh, a rally given by Doris Stokes, who was a famous medium a little while ago. And what Stokes' people would do is they'd, they'd go to a new town and they'd have any number of letters coming in from people desperately wanting Doris to get in touch with someone they'd lost. So Stokes is turning up with, she's got all the information, she doesn't have to really do any cold reading at all. It's called, it's called hot reading. It's known as when you, you know the information up front. But what they'd also do is they'll go through the papers and find any stories of, you know, accidents or where people have been lost. And this woman got a phone call from Stokes' people saying, Doris, has, um, she's got a message for your son. You've lost, you've lost a son in an accident, is that right? She said, yes, it had been in the papers. Um, it was quite a well-publicized thing. Well, she'd like, to, she's got a, you know, she'd like to give you a message from, uh, her, from, her son, uh, from your son, so would, would you come to the rally? And this woman, well, she can't just give me this message on the phone. Well, no, she'd really like you to come to the rally where the spirits are. Okay, so this woman turns up. And she said, they also said to her on the phone, would you wear like a, a red top or just something so she knows to identify you, so she knows where you are. We've got you a really nice seat near the front. So this woman turned up, a bit sort of bemused by the whole thing, but thinking, okay. And uh, during the show, after Stokes had had a few misses, you know, and needed to lift it a bit, she said, oh, there's a lady over there in, in, in the red jumper over there, and, um, oh, there's a lovely lad coming through to me now. He said he, he, he died, and he was your son. It, it was a drowning, wasn't it? Is that right, my love? Is that right? Yes. She's going, yes. Oh, she stands her up. Yes, that's right. Oh, he's just saying, oh, it was terrible, but he, he loves you, and you, 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 you're not to feel bad about it. You're not to blame yourself. And then goes over there, and the audience are amazed, because it looks like she's just been able to... But this woman felt so violated. Mm. I just remembered a story of James Randi about how he unmasked a psychic who was using radio... He had a, he had a earpiece, right, and yeah. he had somebody talking to him by radio who was feeding him information that he was getting from the, from the back of the room. Mm. And Randy actually got an engineer to intercept the radio frequency. Mm. And so he actually had a film, which mm. was shown on national television in America, of this bogus psychic um, calling spirits out and, and saying, you know, I'm, get, I'm getting so-and-so, and getting uncannily accurate information. And all the time, the television audience was hearing mm. the prompting voice that was going into well, the earpiece. They were, earpiece. Hearing, they were hearing. I see, right. Yeah. It, the, the man w should have been completely yeah. destroyed. And what happened, he went on with his career as if nothing had happened. Mm. It's as though people just don't want to know. They don't want th these people to be unmasked. And if they are unmasked, it's almost as though they just go into denial and, and yeah. cut it out. Or maybe there are enough people out there who just hadn't seen that television um, show and so didn't know that he'd been unmasked. But that particular charlatan to this day um, according to Randy, is doing a brisk trade, despite a, an unmasking which could not have been more devastating, you would have thought. Michael Shermer, in one of his books, has a story about how he was, I think he was on stage with a medium who was calling up spirits and, and t talking to people about what their dead relative said, and, and Shermer un unmasked it. He explained on stage about cold reading, told the audience how, how it was done. And afterwards, um, several people in the audience came up absolutely furious with him mm. because he had shattered their illusions. Somehow it was thought to be cruel mm. when people were deriving comfort and consolation from uh, being deceived in, in this way. It was cruel to break that deception. Um, I've known cases of people that have, are, you know, have lost somebody, lost a child that's so dear to them and they cannot get over the fact they've lost the child and become addicted to these charlatans, you know, if you yeah. want a better word, and, and that to me is as cruel as it can be. Now, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't see it as a, as, a, as a mission to turn every believer into a non-believer, but I think it's important to get that message out so people can take it on board and understand it and have more information, because if you have more information you can make better decisions. I'm going to go to a seance where a medium will no doubt call up dead relatives of people mm. in the audience and things, and um, can you give me some tips to what, what, sort of, what to look out for? I think you'll find it probably disappointingly transparent. I think with spiritualist services, a big difference is that the, the medium doesn't really have to do any work because he's got a whole room of, of believers. And that's the difference. If you approach any psychic with any sort of scepticism, you'll see through pretty much all of it unless they happen to get lucky, you know. 
if you go there as a believer, of course you're going to want to make everything fit. And if you're going to a church service every Tuesday, or I think it's normally Tuesday they do these things on, and you're desperate, desperate, maybe this will be the week that, that the medium will get in touch with Albert or whoever, you know, mm. whoever I've lost, you'll do everything to grab at it. So they don't have to really do a lot of work. And if it's, if it's um, something you also have to be aware of, if it's, if it's a group that they're that the medium is familiar with, he'll know a lot of their stories already. And a very common thing with TV psychics um, is that when the cameras are off, they have a chat with people in the audience and find out who wants, who would like yeah. someone to come, anybody uh, else should be looking as transparent as that, is it? I mean, they transparent don't even have... That. What they often do is they bring their own clients with them, pick the ones that cry a lot, and bring them along on filming. But very commonly, before filming starts, they come out, have a chat with the audience, because, they're, again, they're all believers. Is there anybody who's... You've, oh, you've lost someone who drowned in it? Okay, well, I'll, if anybody comes through that's drowned, I'll know that'll be for you. Okay. The best ones just keep talking. They know the value of just really not stopping and just bulldozing over any response from the audience. Uh, the worst ones pause too pause much. The they, thought, yeah, yeah, they get in too much discussion. They're, they're found out. It's creating the illusion to the whole room that the medium's hitting one thing after another. Whereas if you really pay attention to what the person's saying, very often you'll just see they look a bit bemused and a bit bewildered. That does tend to happen. Again, depends on the style of the medium. The most common pattern is going to be Throwing out a sort of a half statement, getting the name Albert, uh, does that mean anything, can anybody find that for me, Albert, uh, someone over here, or is it the lady over there, the, you know, and then the person in the audience will supply the information about, yes, that was my husband, okay. and then you get the medium will add that information, now she knows it's the husband, whereas it could have been anything, it could have been the name of the person in the audience, Albert, it could have been a friend of yours in the audience, mm -hmm. it could have been someone that died, it could have been anything, but now she knows it's the husband, she then feeds that back, or he feeds that back by saying, that's right, it's, it's your husband here, and he's telling me that, you know, you're a lovely wife, and, and moves on as if he'd said it was the husband itself, but yes. he hadn't. You get a statement that's made that's vague. I'm seeing something to do with uh, uh, an accident maybe involving water. You go, yes, that's right, it, you know, when I was young. And he goes, that's right, he's, he's showing me when you were a kid, and he's mm. saying that he was, even, even there, he was there looking after you even when that happened. And you're amazed that he's picked up on his memory. Or you say... Yes, that's right, the dead person died uh, because of an accident in water, and then I'll say, yes, that's right, he's telling me that that's how he passed away, that he drowned, and I'll turn whatever you say. So I, I throw out some words, you give me the meaning, and then I carry on, I reiterate, I feed that back to you as if that's what I intended from the start. Although it's so quick that you really are left with the impression that the medium is has all the information and is giving you, you know, is giving the person in the audience bit after bit and they're not, he's not, he's saying very little and waiting for the feedback and then throwing back. What you'll see is, far from it being all vague or saying things that apply to just everybody, you'll get very specific details being thrown at you. So I'm seeing a pair of, a pair of cufflinks with a, um, um, a sort of a red jewel or something, you know, something really quite specific and normally the person doesn't quite make it fit but then the medium will keep on pushing and start to turn into something else. Well, it's definitely some jewellery. He's definitely showing me jewellery. Uh, and then, of course, they're going to make jewellery fit. Well, yes, it was, uh, I mean, I've got some jewellery at home. That's right. He's saying, have a look in your jewellery box because there's something there you've forgotten. And the red cufflinks have been forgotten. So keeping track of, well, what was the medium pushing for at the beginning? And one, one thing I saw was uh, something to do with this dog that used to sleep in the hallway. And the answer sort of came back, sort of, no. Yeah, well, it's something in the hall. It could be a picture of a dog. picture of a dog in the hallway? And the answer came back, no. I mean, I've just put up another picture. In, I've put up a picture in the hallway of, um, of the family or something. That's it. He's saying he doesn't like the picture in the hallway. You want to, you must, uh, and it, the, dog was, the dog was forgotten. Dog. Yeah. But it actually started off talking about a dog. Yes, yes. And purely because of what the audience member said, now it's about a picture in the hallway. It's become yes. something completely different. But it looks like the medium is just sort of fumbling. Yes. Whereas, in fact, he's gauging everything yes. on what the person's giving us. Some people listening will be saying to themselves, oh yes, well I see that, but on the other hand, I was told a story who was, by somebody who was told a story where the medium really did get an exact fit, and mm. I suppose the point there is that stories only get passed on on the very rare occasions of when course. they do get an exact hit. Well, is that one of the first things you learn as a magician is that, you know, you, you do a trick, but half of the trick happens afterwards when that person remembers it, and then wants to tell somebody else in a way that doesn't make yeah. him look stupid, or look yes. like, I've, you know, he's been fooled. So these stories we hear are always deleted and edited and and twisted in all sorts of ways. I, I, had a, I heard a tale of a, of a psychic who was at a policeman's event, and apparently it was a psychic the police had used, although I think normally it's psychics saying they've helped the police, but I, either way, she was at this event. This was being told to me by a friend of somebody who was there that the psychic spoke to at the end of the evening, and the psychic came up to this guy, who was a policeman, and said, oh, very nice to meet you, and shook his hand. And as she shook his hand, she sort of stumbled back a bit and rolled her eyes back into her head, 
and said in a sort of far-off voice, Oh, you should, you better leave. Henrietta's cold. Henrietta's cold. She's waiting for you. And then she snapped out of it and said, uh, That was, who's, who's Henrietta? And the guy was amazed. He said, Because yes. Henrietta was the name of his car. And when he went outside, it was snowing. <laughs> so Henrietta was cold. Now, this guy tells my friend, my friend tells me yes. with that air of, How do you explain that? Yes. But if the woman had gone up to him and merely said, well, apparently you call your car Henrietta, which was the only bit of information that was of interest, was that was the name of the car. Somebody comes up to you and says that, you just go, oh, who told you that? Obviously, yeah. well, presumably loads of people at the event knew that, you know, he's a policeman, he's called his police car a name, they presumably yeah. know that. Yeah. So it's not a big deal, the fact yeah. that she would know that or might have found it out. But because of how she presented it, through nothing other than showmanship, it made the difference between a, a non-event that would be passed over and a massive event for this guy that has presumably changed his belief on a lot And he of goes things. around telling other people. Goes around telling other people, people and the, yeah. Yeah. During this, the making of this program, I've talked to a number of psychics and palm readers and people like that who've sort of done me. And what slightly disappointed me is that they got spectacularly bad results. I mean, I, I thought at least they'd be good at it and, and, and that they would sort of get a reasonable number oh, of yeah. hits. And, and bearing in mind that but what they are is a, some kind of conjurer. I mean, if a stage conjurer scored as many misses as these people, he'd be booed off the stage. And yet, because they bill themselves as psychics rather than conjurers, paradoxically, they're given more latitude, they're given more license to fail than if they were um, taking rabbits out of a hat or sawing women in half or, or something. Despite the fact that, you know, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary exactly. proof. So yes. you, you'd imagine that it would be... Uh, they have a much harder job. In, the reality is they have everything stacked in their favour. They tell you that it's not, it's not an exact science, you know, that some of this may not work, and all I do is I get a sense of this, and, and you'll help me make that fit, and if it doesn't work, and, you know, some, you know, they make no promises, for a start, which is a very odd, very odd thing from the, from the outset. I don't know what they're claiming if they can't make any promises. And if you're not really making the fit, if you're not playing the game, then, then you're blocking the energy. There was a one discussion uh, I had when we, when we filmed something along these lines that we didn't, didn't end up using because they were just so terrible. Uh, was a discussion between a guy who was just our control subject, so he was neither being difficult or just being honest, and a psychic who said to him, now I'm sensing you live with, you either live on your own or you live with other people. <laughs> and he said, his, his, his response was, uh, I don't know, can you be a little bit more specific? <laughs> so she, she reiterated, well, it's, it's either on your own or with a group of people. And again, he said, well, I'm really not sure what you mean. Can be more specific? At which point the, in, the, um, the instructor intervened quite chippily and said, look, you either live on your own with other people. Which is it? And he said, well, I, I don't know. I live with my family. I'm not, sure we, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that means. She said, well, then you live with other people. Don't, don't block the energy. And was quite livid with him. One, one of the psychics that did tarot cards for me, I asked the question, but how do the spirits actually influence the, mm. the position of the cards? And that was the point where she gave up. It was a different one. She gave up at that point because yeah. I was being... You're blocking the energy, I was being too inquisitive. Yeah. I was being too sceptical. And uh, so that brought the thing to a halt. I had the same thing with the palmist. She started talking about it. And I was trying to be interested, and I sort of was interested. I'd never had it done before. And I said, so what's the, what is the link between your personality and your future and so on. How does, what, what's the, the theory behind how that actually gets into the hand? I thought that would be an interesting right. answer. Same thing, blocking the energy, end of, end of session. Yeah. Now, just talking about the illogicality behind so many of these systems and tarot cards, which are obviously very, very popular, you know, you, the deck is mixed and you choose a number of cards that are sort of laid out and, uh, and then your, your fortune and fate is, is read from them. Of course, the interesting conundrum there is that if you did the same thing five minutes later, you'd pick out very different cards. So presumably your fate and the reading would, ha would be necessarily very different if it's relying on those cards. Five minutes later, it would be, it would be completely different. And the, um, when they've been questioned about this, the answer is, oh, well, that's because your, your fate changes from minute to minute. But then you have to think, well, so presumably to get a tower reading, you'd have to constantly be having a tower reading over and over again in order to know what the accurate situation is if it constantly changes from, from minute to minute. You know, if, if, I, if I'm a tarot reader and you, um, we shuffle and the, the five cards come out and those are the five cards that dictate your fate, that's great. And if you, if you went away at that point, that's fine. You've, I've told you your fate and I've told you everything about yourself oh, in your past, present and future. But, but if, if you said, great, can we just do that one more time, would you not expect the same cards to come yes. out because it's, if it's, it's fixed? A, it's a good question. And if there are other yeah. ones, 
then wouldn't we, you know, but they do say, they say, well, it's because your fate constantly changes. Each time you deal the cards out, your fate changes from minute to minute. So the only answer for you is you'd have to consistently go yes. back. Yes. W w when would you stop? When would you yes. have the correct one? Yes. <laughs> I don't yes. understand yes. that at all. Yes. I did a couple of psychics who, who are quite famous on t television mm. and things. And um, one after another, they, they, they gave up. Um, mm. They would, I mean, what, the first one started talking about my father, and they said, your father in the spirit world is very sorry that uh, he didn't manage to say goodbye properly. So I sort of strung her along for a bit before um, letting her know that my father is in fact still alive at the age of 91. <laughs> um, and uh, th at, that, at that point she just gave up. She said, sorry, it isn't working, the spirits mm. aren't coming through, I'll just mm. have to stop. You'd think if it was real, you'd at least be able to sit there quietly and they'd be able to do it without needing any sort of feedback. You'd feel you wouldn't have to play the game as yes. the sitter. One of the people I went to see was a psychic who asked to have my watch, which he held in his hand to get the spirit vibrations mm. out of the watch, etc. And then he turned up some tarot cards. And then he went through a, a really rather stunning series of misses. Mm. Almost everything that he got wrong. He got my, some elderly relative beginning with the letter G, right. something to do with the advertising profession. <clears throat> uh, total miss. I mean, no, no, no suggestion. Then he got an elderly woman beginning with E. Well, that was a sort of hit because my grandmother's name began began with E. That's incredible. And, yeah. and he <laughs> and it is the commonest letter in the alphabet. Yeah. Um, and he um, said that she had kept lots of cats and, and so I was able to tell him that she absolutely hated cats. They were the ones <laughs> that she the abhorred. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, it, it, it went on and it, and it was yeah. all a total set of fa failures. And then I was afterwards told at the end that he told somebody else that he'd done really well and that he'd got lots of hits and I think he believed it. Maybe I think for he, him that was a yeah, I mean, it was <laughs> best readings But I done. mean, so that there's a, an element of self-delusion yeah. as well as as well as just d deluding the punter about this. The whole skill seems to be not about comforting people. I think that was rubbish. Although they say that it's about getting hits. It's about hearing yes, yes, yes. So it's a strange sort of ego thing. And getting money for it. And getting money for it. So yeah, but so I think. It's not surprising that sort of self-delusion happens and that people after the event will say, yes, that went extremely well and shamelessly, you know, publicise themselves as helping the police solving this murder and that murder when they've done nothing other than presumably just rang up and say, do you want any help? No. <gasps> Unless I, I aided police. Um, that, that, that is self-delusion, but it's self-delusion born out of this sort of, I think, just this sort of ego need that runs behind it. It's a do you feel that there's a, any kind of growth in gullibility of and, and in exploitation of gullibility going on at the moment? I think what well, the psychic industry has been around for so long. It's by no means is it you know, a, modern, a modern phenomenon. Very big in the 19th century. Huge in the 19th century, yes. but you know, in its way always sort of been around, you know, always been around. And the spiritualists of the 19th century that were making tables rise in the air and tambourines bash around in the dark are now, since infrared photography was invented and they were caught out, uh, by photographs in the dark. Now, now they've turned into the modern-day spiritualists who just talk, and it's a lot more difficult to disprove. So it's been around for a long time in different guises. But, you know, we live in an age where less people are going to church, and there's a suspicion of, of science, I think, through the, the, the relativist agenda that sort of, the, you know, that we've, we've been through, of, of all truth is equal, and, you know, you're, nothing's really true, and that my truth is the same as your truth, and it just comes from my culture and my values, and, and, and that's all there is. And when you, if you buy into that, then the scientific model it's just one model which is no more or less valid than the new age model or whatever and that that way of thinking um, throws all rational discussion out the window and all possibility of you know the importance of evidence and the importance of discussing these things as adults out the window and you're sort of left with a, a culture where everything is as valid as everything else so of course that's going to perpetuate uh, an acceptance of Alternative medicines, obviously, which are huge now, and, and belief in these, in these psychics and charlatans, and that industry as well, of people that realise it's a fairly easy job to get up on stage or sit one-on-one -on -one with somebody in, in their front room and charge whatever to trample over your memories of a, of a child that you've just lost. I mean, it's, it's yes. revolting. I'm slightly surprised that the academic sort of sued cornery of... Um, cultural relativism and things which is which is big in academic departments in universities has actually trickled down mm. to that extent into the sort of mass audiences that are fooled by these fakes it feels unfashionable to talk to people about the importance of evidence of of, of testing things uh even just in a little way you know a friend of mine who's uh, who's a psychic 
told me about, you know, she puts crystals in her plants and they, and they grow better. And I said, well, you've got loads of plants. Have you ever put two in the same window and watered them the same, mm. maybe just put crystals in one and not mm. the other? And that's, I mean, I did that and I don't think that's being, you know, nasty or rude. It's just no. kind of curiosity, yes. isn't it? And, uh, but that was being very... Did, did you take offence at that? At that? A little. I was, I was being Western. Yes. I mean, I've actually noticed that, yeah. that, that people have taken offence when I've made the very gentlest and mildest suggestion of something just beginning to approach a sort of, sort of test. But I suppose one person's curiosity is another one's offending somebody else. The, the trickle-down effect is interesting. I think it's, it's always been there, but I think there is... I think with the TV as well, it's become a big thing on TV, and with the amount of TV psychics and mediums we've had, that's brought up a whole load of career mediums and psychics that now can get, easily get a spot on TV or, you know, yes. cheaper to hire or cheaper than, yeah. to go to than the really famous ones, yeah. and it's just become an industry that, you know, we're more yeah. aware of now. Do you blame television, um, whatever they call them, I and mean, commissioning editors and people like that for pandering to this sort of thing? I mean, going after ratings by, by giving airtime to what they must know are fakes and charlatans. The same, it's the same problem with, with newspapers printing scaremongering stories yeah. about, you know, MMR vaccine or things that, you know, aren't, they're not really giving the facts because sensationalist stuff sells papers and it's the same, obviously the same with TV. But, you know, for, uh, someone I know um, spoke to me after a show that I did and there's a f famous TV medium psychic show where a guy goes around and visits haunted places and is able to um, talk about and channel various spirits that are there. And it's a very entertaining, very, very popular program. And normally they often go to pubs and hotels and places like that that are supposedly haunted. And this one pub had a story of a murder and a ghost that was behind it. And uh, everybody, everybody knew it, everyone in the town knew it, it was famous for it. And the film crew came to that town to investigate it and to uh, do a piece on it. The production crew all knew about the story, so for the medium on it to find out about it was no challenge at all. I mean, the fact that he could come up with the details of, of a murder and a ghost was no challenge at all because he would have known that anybody could have told him because it was general knowledge, popular knowledge in the area. So he goes on the show and he channels these spirits and talks about the murder and comes out with all these details and it may, might look impressive if he didn't realise that he had access to that information. But what this person told me when he spoke to me after the show was that the pub owner had made up the story about the, uh, the murder and the yeah. ghost just to create a bit of colour around the pub and, you know, so he wasn't impressed at all. And you can't help but think, those people making that show... They know it's rubbish, they know, yes. but it's it's a popular show. So, yes. you know, and, I, and they would defend it by, by saying, "Oh, it's good for ratings. People enjoy it. Don't be so exactly. po faced. Oh, just just exactly. just enjoy it. It's just just a laugh. That, that's and, what they and, would and say." The, exactly. And then you speak to people on the other hand who really, on the basis of programs like that, and you know, and other stuff that happens to them in, in everyday life, like the phone ringing and someone you know, it's someone they've been thinking of, really base their beliefs. Uh, it, it, you know, they change their lives. They live their lives according to these messages that programs like that and things like that yeah. give out. So I think, I think there's a responsibility that's ignored, but I don't know how on earth you police that. I have seen television alleged documentaries in which they're talking about ghost stories, and they'll get somebody to tell a ghost, I mean, everybody's got, got a ghost story, which they, which mm. they, they heard somebody else tell, which perhaps, perhaps they believe. But where the television people did something, I think, really quite wrong, was they staged it. So instead of just allowing the person to tell the story, right. they actually got actors to, to, re yeah. to, re to, to, to create the story. And they, they didn't claim that it was really, they were really filming it. They admitted that it was actors. Mm. But nevertheless, the fact that it was, and the fact that they had mist all over the place in a spooky atmosphere, would have given far more vividness. People claiming to meet each other in, in dreams when they were asleep. Right. Uh, and, and so they, the three, three men went to sleep, having agreed to, to meet in, in a certain place. And the television company actually staged a meeting with sort of mist, mist mm. swirling around and things. And then they said, well, of course, they, they didn't actually, this didn't actually happen, but nevertheless... They put the idea, in they put the idea in, yeah. into, in, into, into your head. By making it visual, it's much easier to believe in a psychic or a, a, a spiritualist because what they're saying they're doing is quite easy for us to sort of grasp. We can make simple images, vivid images in our minds of what, of what that involves, or what a, what a ghost is, or what a psychic phenomenon is. It's much, it's much easier for us to visualise that and see that than the more complicated and interesting yeah. reasons behind it. And unavoidably, because, you know, who we are as, you know, as people and the way we like to form patterns quickly, and we need to in order to move on and have those patterns as part of what we understand about how the world works, we fall for it, and we fall for it because it's 
easy and appealing. And it's a very difficult thing to get round because you can explain and you can explain, but those explanations are less appealing to the mind. They don't create right. vivid, colourful pictures. The great Carl Sagan was always being approached by people who claimed to have been abducted by aliens. Mm. And he made a rather telling point that if, if he were ever abducted by an, an alien, he would immediately, since they obviously are brilliant mathematicians and physicists, or they couldn't possibly have got here in their spaceships, he would ask them scientific questions, or he'd ask them, please prove Fermat's last theorem, or the Goldbach con conjecture. Um, but not a bit of it. The only thing the aliens ever talk about is things like, we must be good to each other, and, and yeah. things like that, which is totally unoriginal. If you're talking to a dead person via a medium, wouldn't you ask them things like, well, what's it like being dead? Do you, do you eat? Do you sleep? Do you sort of have parties? Do you, um, you know, it, what's God like? All those yeah. sorts of questions. But it's never that. It's, oh, well, tell him I miss him. Yeah. Um, the dog misses him. It's, it's always so incredibly banal, banal yeah. and, and unimaginative. When you listen to the um, demonstrations in a spiritualist church, it really is just about what they believe they're doing is supplying proof. So they're telling you that you know you've got a box of old photographs in a in a cupboard, and uh, that you uh, have got a scar on your left knee from something when you were young, or that you had this or that accident, and you know telling you these things to just sort of constantly supply proof. They never really go anywhere. There's never any sort of real advice involved, which maybe in a way is is a saving grace that you know. You're not telling people to go away and behave in a certain way. But yes, it is mind-numbingly banal. And also, you'd think if, uh, if they really were able to give all this information, they'd at least be able to sort of say the names clearly, as opposed to just sort of giving letters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. No, real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.